Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Metaforum 2023 here at Bozar in Brussels, in a very old building with lots of history. Um, now, after conferences in many different cities, we are happy to be back again in Brussels. Um, so the last four conferences were organized in conjunction with the European Language Grid, our EU project which ran out last year. And today our conference is uh, organized together with European Language Equality, which is running out um, on Friday. Yeah, so end of June, it's the last day of our project. As you all know, <clears throat> that's why we're here. Europe is a multilingual society, multilingualism is at the heart of the European idea. We have 24 official languages and many, many additional regional minority languages, languages of immigrants and so forth. Um, the setup creates many economic, social and technical challenges. I've said this before on other occasions. Some of these challenges are listed here on the slide, like the digital single market, which needs to be multilingual, uh, cross-border, cross-lingual, cross-cultural communication between citizens, organizations needs to be enabled. Right now it's basically non-existing. Uh, and we have an issue, and that's digital language inequality. And what we want to achieve is digital language equality, so that all languages are technologically on the same level. And at the same time, applications such as ChatGPT change everything. We've been working on this topic, uh, most of you in the room are aware of this, for almost 15 years now, started in 2010 with MetaNet and had a number of projects in between. I won't go through the entire history of this conference for time reasons. Um, and back uh, in January 21, we started with European language equality with the first project and then with the second project about a year ago. Uh, <clears throat> still regarded one of the most important political documents in our field is the Jill Evans report that you can see on the screen, Language Equality in the Digital Age, in which the European Parliament officially acknowledges that these topics are important, very important, and that we need to do something that we need to establish a large-scale, long-term coordinated funding program. And essentially, this is what we did in ELE. We designed and uh, conceptualized such a funding program. How long should it be? What should be the main components? Uh, what do we need to do? What are the main priority topics? And so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so in a way, the book that all of you have received and some of you are reading already now, as I can see, uh, that is in a way responding to this uh, recommendation in the Jill Evans report. Uh, we presented these findings already uh, on a number of occasions in the European Parliament, in the Intergroup for Traditional Minorities, uh, National Communities and Language in March last year. Uh, we had a very successful STOA workshop last year, um, and we also talked to Commissioner Gabriel about these topics in March this year this year. And again, uh, the market numbers, yeah, so the global NLP, Natural Language Processing and Language Technology Market, is exploding, uh, estimated to be worth about $340 billion by 2030. I have to point out these are pre-chat GPT numbers, so by now it's probably already approaching $450, $500 billion by 2030. Oh yeah, uh, important footnote, if Europe is not going for a decisive push here, then we will be pushed further to the side. Uh, so investments are needed by the European Union, by the different member states, to really bring about change in this regard, because none of the top players here are European players. Yeah, the relevance and urgency uh, may be in the interest of time. I can skip this slide. I think it's clear. Um, so the, the global market uh, is reaching insane numbers. Uh, we have to make sure that Europe is a key player in this market. The European language technology community is still <coughs> highly fragmented and we need to connect and share resources and continue to build a world-class community, including industry and academia with global impact. And the reason is in the previous slides, especially the previous one. Uh, digital language equality is still not a given. Uh, there will be 
a presentation with the current findings that that yeah that are that will show drastic drastic observations in terms of uh, the predominance of English, but we still need to enable all Europeans to participate in the digital space in their own language. Um, we need to enable European conversations and debates across language borders. Uh, we need democratic online discourse free of organized disinformation campaigns and hate speech, and we need to apply our technologies where they matter and where they can make a difference. And of course, digital sovereignty uh, is still quite an issue. We need to develop and deploy language technologies for Europe, built in Europe. So today we have a one-day conference, yeah, so it, it changes from year to year. Sometimes we have two days, one, sometimes one and a half days. Today we have a one-day conference. We have, again, a project expo, which you will find when you go back to the hall then on the other side. Um, of the corridor, there will be uh, the lunch break and the project expo with about 15 projects presenting themselves. Please talk to the colleagues who prepared these booths. Um, uh, they also include the eight, eight of the nine ELE2 pilot projects. Brief look at the program of today. So after the opening session, uh, including the keynote, we will have a panel discussion on the role of national and regional language institutes for digital language equality. We will have a brief pitch-like lightning speed presentations uh, from eight of the nine ELE pilot projects um, so that you can be going into these discussions with the colleagues in the lunch break in an informed way to ask questions. Then we will have the lunch break and the expo. Uh, we will have one session on European large language models. Uh, we will talk about national language technology and AI programs in Europe. And then the last session will be talking about the language data space, the language edic, uh, and how they are related and how they play together. I'm sure uh, many of you are informed mostly about these things, but still I perceive a bit of confusion. And we specifically organized this session to uh, make sure that the confusion is removed entirely. So, and then we will close the conference, and then we will have a short reception. So, thanks very much. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the conference. And with this, I would like to hand over to our invited keynote speaker, uh, Jordi Soleil. Ah, I can already see him uh, at the front. Uh, Jordi Soleil is a member of the European Parliament. He's a a uh, Catalan politician, and since January 2017, he's been a member of the European Parliament. Um, he's a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, on the Committee of Budgets, and he's also a member of the STOA panel. So, Jordi, join me on stage. The floor is yours. Round of applause. Since uh, this is a meeting and event on multilingualism and language equality, let me start by saying uh, bon dia. Uh, es un plaer per mi avui estar aquí amb tots uh, vostès. That's in Catalan, in English, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be with you uh, today. And I would like to, to thank members of the uh, LA project for inviting me to address you in this um, Metaforum, especially thanks to Georg and, and Andy. Uh, we've been working uh, together very closely for, for the last few months uh, to increase or to try to increase uh, visibility of the LA project and bring in its findings into the European uh, institutions. Uh, as one of the few native uh, Catalan speaker uh, MEPs, very aware of the challenges, but also of the opportunities that digital tools can offer uh, to languages, especially the so-called lesser used languages, I feel uh, very honored to be able to speak uh, here today. Europe is a mosaic of uh, languages, of cultures, of peoples. Diversity is a constituent element of our Europe. United in diversity is our motto. It should be then at the core of the EU action and policies 
to preserve and promote uh, this diversity in order that we make, make sure we could have, we can have, we can continue, continue having diverse societies that live uh, together in the use of different languages. These languages, uh, you know better than anyone, these languages, languages are much more than a communication tool. They are traits of identity, they are vectors of culture, and ways of understanding and explaining the world. They are a link to our ancestors and to the next generations. Every language, regardless, regardless of its status and number of speakers, is a treasure created and polished over, over generations. They, therefore, they all, all deserve to be protected while paying, of course, special attention to the promotion and preservation of those languages which, for historical, political, or demographic reasons, are in a situation of a greater weakness, that is to say, uh, so-called regional and minority languages. The preservation of multilingualism as an expression of Europe's intrinsic diversity is a political commitment that faces today significant challenges. We have built a world with very powerful uniformizing tendencies, trends that make it increasingly difficult to protect the treasure of cultural and linguistic diversity, so much so that at world level, a language disappears every two weeks and up to 90% of existing languages could disappear by the beginning of the next century. The digital world has a great impact on multilingualism and linguistic diversity, despite the fact that so far this impact has rather been in favor of the big planetary world languages and therefore against the promotion of linguistic diversity, digital tools can and must be an ally of multilingualism. But they need, they need a clear political commitment. They need clear support from institutions. They need political will from us. Language equality needs political will from everyone. Otherwise, most European languages could be facing digital extinction. Once properly developed, digital tools can, in principle, be at the service of any language. If, in fact, they can be a tool to correct the digital inequality prevailing today, an inequality that is on the rise even, even among the official languages that have all the political, legal, and financial support of states, of governments, as has been demonstrated by the LA2 project. In other words, the gap between English and the other languages is getting, getting bigger and bigger by the day. Digital tools can be part of the solution to correct these trends towards uh, language dominating everything and nearly all the others, with few exceptions, on the verge of digital extinction. Let me say there is nothing wrong with mastering languages that allow us almost everywhere to overcome language barriers, such as English or languages that allow us to communicate in many parts of the world, such as Spanish or French. On the contrary, it is good and it is practical. But this doesn't mean that everything must end up being communicated and disseminated in this handful of languages. This doesn't mean that we renounce to apply digital tools and language resources to the other languages. What would be more reasonable from the point of view of linguistic diversity would be to put digital tools at the service of all languages, to let all languages the immense opportunities enjoy, the immense opportunities the digital world can offer. This is more necessary than ever in a world where the temptation to stop using our own languages is enormous for various reasons. In this sense, Preserving linguistic equality in the, in the digital age must be a, a goal assumed by all EU institutions. We have since 
we have seen that since the end of the last century, digital languages, tools, and resources have increased and improved exponentially. But this transformative technology has exposed and even exacerbated the big digital inequality that, that exists between languages. Many of these technologies are deepening this imbalance due to their reliance on large amounts of data derived primarily from English language sources. And more worrying is the asymmetry between official and non-official European language in terms of available availability of digital resources, despite some commendable efforts being done by governments in places like Catalonia or the Basque Country to respectively promote Catalan and Basque languages in the digital world. In the European Parliament, we have long expressed our concern for the future of multilingualism in the digital age. As Georg uh, was mentioning before, in a landmark document our Parliament adopted in 2008 and 18, sorry, a resolution on achieving language equality in the digital age, the rapporteur of which, of which was my Welsh colleague and former MEP, Jill Evans. Based on this report, the Panel for the Future of Science and Technology, STOA, of which I am a proud member, held at the end of 2022 a seminar entitled Towards Full Digital Language Equality in a Multilingual European Union, which presented the results of the European Language Equality LAB project. Another of the initiatives we undertook to make the LAB program a reality is that in January of this year, together with 18 MEPs, we jointly signed a letter addressed to the former Commission for Culture, uh, Madame Gabrielle, explaining the program and asking her for support, for more support. And in March, we had a fruitful meeting with her to discuss, to discuss ways to make ELE a new program. We are convinced it's time to initiate a new large-scale scale European language technologies research, development, and innovation program. It is about our fundamental values, but it's also about market opportunities we are missing today in Europe. Languages, technologies, language technologies made in Europe should foster and support multilingualism while adhering to European values such as privacy by design, transferability, fairness, diversity and openness, transpar transparency and transferability, accountability, public wealth, individual rights and collective purposes. Recognizing that European languages are currently not equally served and supported in terms of digital services and opportunities will encourage the development of technologies, tools, and resources that, are, that at present are available, as I was mentioning, mentioning before, only for a small, a small number of thriving languages. And to conclude, let me say that it's tempting. Uh, many times it is tempting to think that multilingualism begins and ends with the languages that have a guaranteed official status. In the case of the EU, the 24 languages that appear in the treaties as being official languages of the Union. I have to say this is the normal thinking here in Brussels. But the EU, in the EU alone, there are at least 60 other languages that also deserve to be preserved and encouraged, despite the fact that they don't have or some of them don't have yet official status. The findings of the LA project and the proposal for a dedicated EU program should be especially appealing for those non-EU official languages. This is why we must welcome initiatives like the LA project and work to together towards a union in which all languages and all speakers of these languages enjoy the same rights. I thank the LA team and the LA community for all the amazing work you have delivered until today. All your findings, all your publications, all your proposals have shed light to both the prevailing reality of digital language inequality 
and the need to react. But the work is not finished yet. There is no future for language diversity if we don't make available now digital technologies for each and every language. And every language. So, dear friends, let's involve EU institutions to make this a reality. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, you're all very, very welcome. Just want to echo Georg's uh, welcome uh, remarks. Um, it's great to see everybody. Uh, it's the first time we've seen many people even working on the project. We've been together for three years now, um, two and a half years officially, you know, with EU funding with us, but uh, six months before that, writing the proposal. Uh, and uh, last night and today is the first time that we've seen each other, uh, some of us, uh, over the last three years. So uh, it's great to see so many uh, sort of uh, old friends and uh, new friends, hopefully, uh, in the room today. So uh, you're all very welcome to this general overview of ELE, but it's also um, a presentation of the, the, the book that you all have a copy of. Um, again, Springer have done a nice job. They always do a nice job. But, uh, you know, over 150 people participated in the production of this book, many of whom are in the room, and you should all be very proud. Uh, it's a nice job. I checked this morning. There were over 13,000 uh, interactions already online. Um, not all by human beings, of course, but uh, 13,000 of them is, is no mean feat, and we've already started to be cited. So, um, so do make sure that you, you, you use this well. Um, we have lots of extra copies uh, to land on desks of important people who can, as uh, Jordi has just said, try to influence um, you know, getting the ELE program you know, on people's uh, agendas and, uh, and properly funded. So, uh, so uh, um, you know, if you've already read uh, chapter one, uh, essentially you can kind of nod off now because this, this session is really about um, is really about that and you, you, you've seen this slide already, you've seen this document uh, that uh, both Georg and Jordi have already alluded to. Um, you know, the, the Jill Evans report in, tw in 2018, or known as the Jill Evans report, um, and the, as has already been said, the EU flags the importance of digital services being available in all languages to ensure a level playing field uh, and full access to services across Europe. And, and 21st century, uh, where we are now, uh, language cannot be a barrier to access to information, but it still is, unfortunately. Many people who would uh, wish to uh, communicate and participate online using their preferred language cannot do so. They have to um, sort of uh, reserve uh, or, or uh, sort of back off to um, you know, one of the, the, the so-called major languages in order to participate fully online in, in the digital world. And that's not, that's not fair and that's not right. And you know, we've tried to, to, to put together uh, a program uh, and an agenda and also a budget an indicative budget uh, as to you know, what is needed over the next 10 years to, to make that a reality. So this report of, of Jill's and, and uh, fellow parliamentarians endorses language equality in the digital age. And as Geordie has already said, uh, language technology is really you know, one of the only means to, by which to, to, to make digital uh, language equality a reality. Um, should be at the, uh, the center of EU policy making, and it currently is not, uh, or certainly not um, uh, sufficiently. Um, uh, despite the fact that this uh, was, as you can see on the slide, you know, overwhelm overwhelmingly supported by the, the European Parliament. Very few people uh, were against it. Uh, uh, and you know, f of the 45 recommendations in the report, three of them are on the slide you've seen already. Georg uh, has alluded to this large-scale long-term coordinated funding program. We call it the ELE program as part of the, the ELE project. Um, uh, and uh, that's fully fleshed out with dates and timelines, agendas, research topics, uh, so some of which are more engineering focused and some of which are more blue sky uh, uh, research uh, oriented, sort of trying to get towards nat uh, natural language understanding uh, over the next 10 years or so. Uh, you, know, you might hear in, in the newspapers online that these are solved problems, but they're nowhere near solved problems um, for the vast majority of use cases and, and language scenarios. So, um, you know, like do correct, you know, journalists and people who don't understand the situation, you know, uh, we cannot have people believe that this is a solved problem. It's far from a solved problem. Uh, it, it, the other uh, recommendations on the slide were to create a European language technology platform for the sharing of services. We've done that with our sister project ELG. And as uh, both Jordi and Georg has, has, have already said, you know, we need to secure our leadership in language-centric AI. 
So as well as the people in the room who are in Europe uh, working uh, on this topic, you know, many of the other leading institutions around the planet, not uh, necessarily in Europe, have at their core, you know, Europeans who have been enticed away from where we live to, um, to sort of fund these projects and make them reality. And, and many of the, the, uh, the, the companies that uh, Georg had on his slide, none of which were, were European based, unfortunately. So, as I said, we've been together for, for, for three years now, six months before the official start of the project in January 2021. Um, many of you were here uh, last year, uh, and many of the same people are in the room. I couldn't make it myself. Um, but uh, ELE2 started just around the time uh, that this photo was taken. Um, we are now at the end of the project, as Georg said. We finish on Friday. We have a review next week. Uh, and then the project is over. And um, regrettably, you know, uh, many of the people on the project um, are project funded and then will be sequestered onto other projects. So, you know, um, we are, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of resources that we, people, the, the participants on the ELE project itself, can put to pushing this, this uh, agenda um, is reduced. But, you know, we have a lot of goodwill in the room uh, around Europe. We have the whole community behind us. We try to include everybody uh, as part of the, the project, and I think that goodwill remains, and uh, hopefully the book will be uh, uh, a, a, a nice influencer in that regard. Um, so, as Gabe has already said, Jill's um, uh, report recommends this, this large-scale long-term coordinated program. We've put that together. Um, we've delivered the SRIA and a roadmap and a budget. Uh, as to how that might happen. And Georg and Maria will present a summary of some of the, uh, the, the results, um, some of which are, are um, not necessarily positive results. Uh, the gap has widened uh, uh, even since the, the 2012 white papers, unfortunately, with respect to English, as, as Geordie has already pointed out. So this is it's even more crucial that we act now. The, the time for acting uh, was, was, it was long before this point, but... Um, you know, the gap is getting even wider, and that cannot be uh, a good thing, even for those of us in the room who are native speakers of English. None of us want that to... None of us want uh, Europe to be just a, a, a monolithic society where we just... Everybody communicates through English. So 66 deliverables, um, many of which are freely available on the website. Uh, I think some of them are, are, um, are sort of um, confidential. Uh, but we have nothing to hide. It's all in the book. Um, as, as Georg says, uh, in his slides that he'll, uh, he'll show in a minute, we have uh, um, uh, a full list of all, all of the deliverables. Um, and again, many of you in the room were, uh, were uh, critical to the production of those. Um, so we have the uh, updates to the, the, the white papers. Uh, those are chapters 5 to 37 in the book. We engage with a broad consultation with a range of stakeholders across Europe. And we have chapters uh, in the book 38 and 39 uh, involving those. Uh, four deep dives on machine translation, speech, text analytics, and data. Um, those are chapters 40 to 43. And there are summaries of the state of the art in, in uh, language processing and uh, language-centric uh, AI. And uh, EU strategic plans on AI and language technology. They are also chapters in the book. And again, we have dedicated sessions later on today on those topics. Uh, I'll leave ELE2 to, uh, to Georg's slides. So very quickly, um, you know, we had uh, uh, five core partners, ourselves, DCU, coordinating the project, coordinating jointly with DFKI uh, in Berlin. Um, we have uh, partners, uh, core partners in ILSP in Athens, uh, Charles University in uh, Prague, and uh, EHU uh, uh, in uh, Donostia, uh, San Sebastian in, in the north of Spain. Um, leading each of these, these, uh, these projects, many of you, uh, m uh, these work packages, many of uh, you have seen this before. Here is the, uh, the 18 month timeline. Uh, Georg will talk more about the timeline for ELE2. Um, and here, here are the 66 deliverables on the slide, uh, very small, um, but many of you participated in, in all of these projects. And, uh, uh, and much of which was uh, taken on board, and uh, you will see it featured in the, the book that you will have. Here is a list, list of all the deliverables um, in, in their glory. Um, uh, a number of official deliverables, but we are very pleased to say, and especially thankful to the additional reports that we uh, have published under the ELE brand. 
on Serbian, Bosnian, the Nordic minority languages, West Frisian, and just recently in the can, uh, a report by Vincent on, uh, on the European Sign Languages. So these are over and above what we were committed to delivering, and uh, we are pleased to, to have those as part of the ELE family. These are, as, as it says, they're uh, non-contractual, but um, they add to the body of work in, the, in this space, and uh, I think a, a great contribution. So you've seen this slide already. You know, the, the work that we have done has already uh, started to be impactful. Uh, both uh, at the European Parliament and the European Commission levels. Uh, you know, I won't spend any more time on this because uh, both Jordi and, um, and uh, Georg have, uh, have uh, talked about this already. But, and Georg will provide a summary of, of um, why this program is needed more than ever to ensure digital language equality for all European languages over the next 10 years. Because what we have demonstrated uh, uh, is, is that the situation is much worse than was uh, sort of uh, hypothesized to be the case. Even uh, uh, when the G11's report came out in 2018, you know, the gap has, uh, has widened, unfortunately, and regrettably, it's, the situation is much worse. So, uh, you know, with that doom and gloom, I will hand over to, to Georg and then, uh, uh, and then hence to, uh, to Maria, who will present some of the, uh, the highlights of the, the, the project. So, um, I will keep it very brief because Maria's presentation will, you give, will give you all the numbers. Uh, but just to, to prepare the ground a little bit, in ELE1 already we uh, prepared a digital language equality metric. It was yeah, heart, the heart of the project in a way. So, uh, with various definitions like digital language equality or DLE is the state of affairs in which all languages have the technological support and situational context necessary for them to continue to exist and to prosper as living languages in the digital age. And the DLE metric then is a measure that reflects the digital readiness of a language and its contribution to the state of technology enabled multilingualism tracking its progress towards the goal of full digital language equality. As mentioned, this is the heart uh, in a way of um, of our communication activities, of our main findings, um, of the ELE dashboard. Um, and this is grounded on uh, statistical evidence, in a way, uh, which is given by European Language Grid, which now contains more than 16,000 resources and growing. So we believe ELG, the ELG catalog, consists of a fairly representative set of uh, resources and technologies. Yeah, we have very rich metadata that we can then analyze statistically uh, to produce a picture of where we currently are in terms of digital language equality or rather inequality. Um, in addition, we uh, worked out contextual factors and contextual, there's an alarm going, which we can maybe sh stop somehow. It's technology, I know. Yeah, so and, and, and our contextual factors, factors um, take into account the situational context of a language. Yeah? So does the political, social political context of a language uh, incentivize the development of technologies and data sets for this specific language? Um, and our findings as of around about last year look like this. Yeah, so English, uh, by far the best supported language. And then we have our trio of Spanish, uh, French, and German. Uh, then there's another big gap. And then the long tail starts with, with additional European languages. This doesn't look too good. Um, contextual scores, similar. Yeah, so these take into account um, information like the GDP, for example, the official status of a language. Yeah? Is it an official status? Is it a minority language? Is it a recognized minority language or not? Etc. And we can see clearly see that many of these languages, yeah, they don't really have a chance. Yeah. So they they exist in social political ecosystems that don't even warrant the generation or development of technologies or resources. And this is an issue. So in uh, Andy presented ELE one, a brief overview. ELE two, uh, same group of five core partners. We only had one year, so we had to be quick and short. Uh, and we uh, brought on board once again Efnil and Elen uh, as partners number six and seven to have the official um, associations for the language communities on board. We extended our project timeline 
as you can see um, yeah, by this additional uh, block here, which is the ELE2 project, as mentioned, only one year, so we didn't have that much time, but we organized uh, a few additional feedback loops for the content that we had already prepared for the SRIA. Um, and then the idea was to maintain the SRIA, to revise it, to bring in additional feedback, additional insights uh, on the way to the ELE program. Um, so uh, next up first, Maria will talk about the ELE dashboard and will present some findings um, as they currently stand, or last week maybe. Uh, to give you the numbers and the statistics, uh, as mentioned, these are not particularly positive. Um, I will give you a very brief, after that presentation, a very brief overview of the SRIA. Um, we will then have um, also as ELE2 output, ELE2 activities, we will have the session on national and regional language institutes for digital language equality. Um, and as ELE2, we also organized the FSTP projects, yeah? so financial support to third parties. We had a bit of project money set aside to fund additional projects. We had additional project calls and proposals. We selected nine of them who um, only had, yeah? so we had one here in the project in total, and for the FSTP projects, I think we had about three months. Uh, so very, very short, lightning kind of projects. Uh, but nevertheless, they produce great results, which will be pitched in the session at uh, 11.45, and which you can also see in the expo. Already uh, earlier this year, we published this book here, the European Language Grid Project, and now finally, it has its sister, yeah, so the sibling book is, is with us. Uh, you have a copy, the European Language Equality Book. Andy already gave you all the stats, so no need for me to repeat that. Um, I would like to also uh, say many, many thanks to all the contributors, 154 of them. Um, so I, I try to reproduce all the names here on the screen. It's not really possible uh, unless you have very good eagle eyes. Uh, so many of you uh, contributed uh, one or more chapters even, so many thanks to all of you. We have lots of spare copies. Uh, please take them, please distribute them uh, in your countries, to your governments, etc so that we can make the ELD program happen. Thank you very much, uh, and I would like to hand over to Maria Yacou from ILSP. So, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here again this year. I'm Maria Yangu, but I'm presenting, of course, today on behalf of a large group of colleagues at the Institute for Language and Speech Processing, who contributed to this work over the last approximately three years uh, to the development of the digital language equality dashboard and the um, language comparisons that uh, were facilitated to a large extent by this dashboard. So the presentation will start with a short flashback to the previous, the first phase of uh, ELE and its main findings. I know that some of you are already depicted in these photographs and uh, may have seen some of the slides before, but it will be very short. Um, a stop to present shortly the European Language Grid platform and database, because this is uh, the evidence base of our investigations. And the main part of the presentation are the functionalities, the enhanced functionalities of the digital language equality dashboard and some of the conclusions that we have been able to draw um, by uh, comparing the European languages. So, an overview of the first phase of the ELE. Um, one of our aim, main aims and goals in this project was to propose uh, recommendations as a strategic agenda for achieving digital language equality that are evidence-based. For this reason, we used, we exploited the, the European Language uh, Grid database and platform, which is not, it is not only a repository of language resources and technologies, but it also acts as an aggregator of existing metadata records, records hosted in um, some of the main repositories in our field. 
And uh, this database um, allowed us to develop the digital language equality dashboard and perform some visualizations. Let me also note that um, uh, some great part of this uh, work for populating the, the European language grid has been performed during the first phase of uh, ELE when the, the 52 ELE partners discovered almost 6,000 new metadata records for language resource technologies, were, which were not already at that time listed in ELG. We uh, ingested these metadata records after mappings and conversions, and they are now part of the ELG platform. One of uh, the remarkable outcomes of um, uh, the first phase of VLE has been the language reports, which provided a concise state of the art for each European language, specifically for 43 European languages. They were authored by approximately 100 people, some of you here today. And all this work allowed us to uh, draw some high-level conclusions uh, which can be summarized very, very briefly with these points, that the better supported languages in Europe are the official EU languages. MEP Solé previously said that for Brussels, these are usually the languages that the European institutions focus on. But this is uh, actually confirmed by the numbers. Among them, the best supported ones are, as expected, English, Spanish, German, and French. The least supported ones are Irish and Maltese. And um, with respect to technologies, most languages seem to be well supported with, language, with translation technologies. Uh, data sets, with respect to data sets, the, um, the least populated uh, types of data sets are multimodal corpora and language models, where in 2022. So long story short, you have already seen this slide. The main takeaway message has been that with very few exceptions, all languages are severely underrepresented with resources and technologies. And this brings me to the description of the ELG catalog. Um, the, the ELG catalog did not freeze in time when the ELE1 and ELG projects ended last June. On the contrary, we, its population continued by employing several metadata aggregation strategies. So when in June 2022, uh, the ELG database comprised approximately 12,000 uh, metadata records. And a few days ago, this number raised up to approximately 16,000 with 8,000 corpora approximately 4,000 technologies, 3,000 lexical and conceptual resources, and so on. As you can see in this graph, most of the metadata records have been natively created in the ELG uh, platform, while the rest come from some of our very well-known repositories, the LRC Share repository, the ELRA catalog, uh, some of the Clarin national repositories, but also Zenodo and Hiking Phase. These evolving contents of uh, the European language grid provided us with uh, the database we needed to perform analytics on what is available for the European languages today, the, the DLE dashboard, Digital Language Equality. It is a web-based and online dashboard you can uh, type in the, the link provided on screen, or you can find the respective link three, through the ELG homepage. And it provides an easy to use mechanism for uh, exposing and monitoring the digital language equality metrics and a measurement of the level of um, the te technological support that our languages enjoy. So what the main functionalities, as I said, you can have uh, some views, comparable views of the digital language equality metrics. You can compare across languages, for instance, compare different types of data sets, as in this graph, software versus data, or compare uh, languages as per different feature, uh, types of feature uh, of resources, um, different visualizations, not only histograms and bar charts, but a matrix here, it is a heat map. 
tables from where you can download the raw data and perform additional explorations. Radial maps such as this one which compares Basque and Catalan. In the within language comparison section, one can focus on a specific language and compare different uh, features of resources, such as here for Croatian, monolingual, and multilingual corpora. And finally, a very interesting addition to the dashboard has been the visualization of the evolution of the number of resources over time. And uh, you can see here how this number evolves since the offset of the ELG platform in alternative visualizations. Now, the, the graphs you will see on the next slides have been generated by this online dashboard. For instance, this matrix, what it shows, selected uh, EU languages. Actually, I have selected here only the EU official ones and uh, different technologies, different groups of technologies, for instance, uh, text processing, speech processing, translation technologies, and different types of resources. And you can see that um, uh, the darker the cells, meaning that uh, the more resources that uh, are represented in that specific cell for the language and the specific resource type. So, let me try and show it here. The darker column here are corpora, which means that all your official EU languages are well supported with corpora. The next one here is lexical and conceptual resources. And then you go here, something like okay, light or something between light and dark. These are the translation technologies. And then the first column are text processing technologies. The lighter columns are, uh, well, I can't read it there, but I remember it is image and video processing, natural language generation, and human-computer interaction. Um, if we dig in and uh, do perform some more explorations, for instance, here you can see a graph where uh, I have set the media type for data sets to audio, image, and video. So I'm requesting a graph for multimodal data. These include also the sign languages, the data sets for sign languages. Um, as you can see, the only language that uh, performs well is English. Some are severely underrepresented um, here. Uh, the, the worst one is Maltese in this view. This is another graph you have uh, already seen, the technological DLE scores, but this is a screenshot taken a year ago, back in June 2022, and this one was from last week. As you can see, the overall picture is the same, meaning that uh, to the left of the graph, we always see the official EU languages, the large official EU languages, some national official languages such as Norwegian, Icelandic, uh, Turkish, etc. And the long tail are Europe's regional and minority languages. Some things have changed, and that is that almost all languages have increased their scores. English has increased it by approximately 30%. But, of course, the, the increase for small languages, if any, is negligible. Uh, at any case, it is not visible in this aspect ratio. When examining the positioning of the languages, again, it has remained almost identical between 2022 and uh, 23. This is true for both the list of the top 10 performers overall and the top 10 non-EU official languages. Some small uh, shifts in position, for instance, here in the fifth and sixth places, should be circumstantial. And now, the, the graphs representing the evolution of resources uh, over time. What we can see here for eight indicative languages, English among them, the blue line, is the number of resources contributed since the beginning of the ELG platform for every quarter of a year. And the, the conclusion that can be immediately drawn is that English contributes 
more resources, but it also contributes, contributes them regularly, steadily. There's, it is very rare that uh, at a given quarter in a year, some other language will contribute more metadata records to the LG database than English. In this alternative visualization, again, of the evolution of resources over time, um, it is interesting to note, first of all, that all languages are progressing, of course, because, as I said, the, the ELG catalog is continuously populated and harvested in other, meta, other repositories. But what is also very interesting is to see how steep this progress is, how steep the line is. And as evident, the steepest line is the one representing English, the blue line. This means that in English is uh, progressing at a greater pace. And this is especially true for um, the, the right part of this graph, uh, meaning these are quarters first and second of 2023, so the beginning of uh, the current year. So why English is progressing at such a, gr a greater pace compared to other languages in 2023, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it has to do with the emergence of generative AI and large language models, which are more relevant for English, as we all know, than for any other language. Uh, so this means that uh, because English has not in decreased the distance between English and the other languages, the gap has not decreased, on the contrary, it has increased, maybe the recommendations of our strategic research and innovation agenda are more relevant today than they were a year ago. And with this, I thank you very much. Thanks very much, Maria, for these insights. Now, I'm the most unpopular person in the room because I'm standing between you and the coffee break. But I will only take about 10, 15 minutes uh, to give you a very brief overview of uh, what we compiled in the last two and a half years. Um, in terms of our ELE strategic research, innovation and implementation agenda. So that was the, the overall goal um, of the two projects. Uh, informed in ELE1 by more than 60 project reports and more than 2,000 pages with condensed findings, all in all more than 90 languages taken into account. And this plan represents voices from research industry and civil society uh, in terms of research, more than 30 uh, reports on the situation of individual languages, the language reports condensed in the book in 34, 35 chapters. All in all, um, we carried out many interviews with various experts from the field to get some additional ideas, insights. Uh, we had the SME partners in the project in ELE1 produce four technical deep dives with other companies, with other researchers to provide some fresh, new, innovative ideas for their fields. Um, and all in all, in this broader um, group of people, we think about 500 or up to 750 people all in all contributed. We also carried out a survey, yeah, our, uh, our European citizen survey, got more than 20,000 responses to the survey, and all of this is in a way baked into our plan. Um, to avoid any confusions, uh, one slide on the version history. So. Um, in November last year, we had the very first version 0.9 available on the ELE website uh, in time for the STOA workshop um, that Jordi also mentioned briefly. That was end of last year. Then we finalized that version late November. That was version 1.0. Um, in a way, we think that the, that the ELE book is uh, yeah, the main version 1.5 summarized in the last chapter. Um, chapter 45, that was, uh, yeah, so March 23 on the slide because we finalized and submitted the book in March to the publishing house. Um, and just now we are finishing um, an addendum document, a supplementary document, uh, which will be published on the ELE website soon. That's our version 2.0 combined with the book. 
and some additional ideas, additional findings from ELE2, from other discussions that we had, and especially with insights and results from the FSTP projects. The executive summary uh, essentially stays the same. Most of these items were already mentioned today. Um, back about 10 years ago, the Metanet study with the white paper said that at least 21 European languages in danger are in danger of digital extinction, even though politically all languages are supposed to be equal. Uh, but technically, they clearly are not. So this needs to be changed. And yeah, so you can see by the graphs that Maria has shown that uh, yeah, things are right now getting worse rather than better uh, in terms of the gap between English and the other languages. Um, the Jill Evans report suggested strongly that Europe needs to take action and should set up this large-scale long-term funding program. Um, our current results sh still show an extremely strong imbalance. Yeah? So we have language inequality uh, in terms of technology support. All languages except English are very much under-resourced. Uh, at the same time, we have applications and novel technologies like ChatGPT, which are a multi-billion dollar business or multi-billion euro business, yeah, but primarily uh, no European players are benefiting from this uh, new line of technologies here. At the same time, the EU is concentrating on data spaces and the data economy, which is good, but mostly ignoring our languages and NLP, LT, AI research in this area. There is a bit of funding, but it's not sufficient. And we recommend setting up this large-scale, long-term funding program. Um, for the Maria Gabriel meeting, we prepared these graphics here. So this is the current situation. Yeah, we have support for data and AI from the EU. That's good. This is largely missing. So where are our languages? Pretty much absent in these plans. And what about language technologies? As mentioned, there is a little bit of funding, but it is still insufficient. Uh, and this intersection here, this is about supporting all European languages and enabling all citizens of Europe to participate in the digital age using their mother tongues. And this intersection is also a multi-billion euro business. Good news is, yeah, so this area will be addressed by the recently started language data space project, started in January, more on this in the afternoon and also by the emerging language edic, yeah, that will go right into this intersection, into the sweet spot that we need to address. So what's the state of play in 2023? Um, we have seen the graphs, we have seen the Jill Evans report, we have seen that the gap is getting bigger rather than smaller, which is quite concerning. We have seen that many of our languages uh, exist in social political ecosystems that do not incentivize, encourage, or foster the development of technologies for these languages. So what shall we do? Our recommendations are uh, structured in, yeah, in this way, in the standalone document, uh, which you can find on the ELE website, um, and also yeah, in, a, in a slightly extended form in the ELE book, uh, we have research recommendations, recommendations in the area of technology and data, infrastructure, policy, governments, governance and implementation. And one of the most important distinctions is that we want to set this up as a shared program between the EU and the participating countries. Probably the member states, most of the member states, ideally all of the member states, maybe even additional countries. Um, like in other European funding programs. So this needs to be tailored to Europe's needs, demands and values uh, and with the goal of establishing digital language equality. The role of the European Union and European Union funding we think should be uh, focused towards coordination, shared infrastructures, scientific goals so that all European countries that participate in this program yeah have the same goals and share the same principles in terms of conducting research and trying to find new technologies uh, for new application areas. And our main scientific goal here is deep natural language understanding, which we want to reach by 2030. Language models will clearly play a role here, but more needs to be done to really 
uh, achieve this yeah, holy grail almost of, of natural language processing and natural language understanding um, that we set ourselves. Um, and then the participating countries, they need to reserve funding and need to invest in development of technologies for their languages. Yeah, we can't really expect the European Union to prepare funding and to provide funding for all the languages. This is clearly not realistic. We need to address the lack of available data for all European languages except English. We need to uh, ideally allocate multilingualism and language technology once again to the portfolio of a commissioner. It used to be, it suddenly vanished a few years ago, uh, but we think the topic is important enough to warrant inclusion in the portfolio of a commissioner. To focus on open source, open access, open standards, interoperability, oops, that was the wrong button, interoperability and foster standardization of technologies and approaches. Strengthen existing and emerging infrastructures, platforms and data spaces and also ensure access to suitable HPC infrastructures. I already mentioned our main scientific goal, which is deep natural language understanding. By 2030, uh, we need to create large open access language models for all European languages, including data sets. We need to do research in terms of multilingual models. We need to find ways and approaches of including symbolic knowledge, like knowledge graphs, uh, discourse features, so that we have text genre specific processing, for example. And we have many, many additional recommendations, way too many that I uh, cannot even summarize them here. So you will find the fine print in the book. We have dedicated ideas, recommendations for machine translation, for speech, for text understanding, and so on. Our main idea is to structure this into three chunks of three years each, um, to run from approximately 24 until 32. Um, but of course, the countries and the European Union need to sit together and discuss the needs and goals to define also the financial setup. Um, right, so the main six areas that we would like to concentrate upon, with an emphasis on the first one, language modeling. Um, of course, we need to concentrate also on the coordination of the whole program, uh, which is really key, yeah? so uh, that we have one set of shared principles in terms of conducting scientific research, including uh, evaluation metrics, evaluation methodologies, uh, going over maybe even to data set curation for pre-trained language models. Yeah, how do we compose the data sets? It's getting more and more crucial, more and more important, how, how we really put together these data sets for the overall performance of the resulting models, so it uh, doesn't matter. Or it, it would maybe not be wise if every country tries to do their own thing here. Uh, it makes sense to coordinate and do this together. Uh, we devised a set of projects that tackle these different things, yeah, for coordination, for research, for innovation, for deployment. Um, and we applied rather conservative numbers, yeah, so uh, not just one project, but maybe a couple per area, per. Uh, per, per field that we need. Um, and then when we put all of these numbers together, we arrive at something like 700 million euros, yeah, which is a number that is, it appears to be very high. Compared to other areas, it's modest, I would say. Uh, and in addition, we have foreseen 150 million euros uh, in, yeah, in terms of flexible funds for those countries and those languages that really do need support, yeah, which are unlikely to get support from the countries that they, let's say, exist in or are being spoken in. Um, the investments needed per language, super difficult to predict. Uh, we devised it like this. Uh, languages with weak or no support, we think maybe 40 to 50 million. Uh, can make a difference here, and then we can relax that number a little bit, the higher uh, it is supported technologically already now. Um, and these investments are needed then by the countries yeah, themselves. This is very much aligned with existing projects, existing initiatives, existing infrastructures, platforms, and, and other activities, um, as mentioned on the slide here. So uh, we have all of these in mind when devising this and presenting this to you. 
uh, this is aligned with the data spaces uh, approach, for example, with the existing infrastructures in the various areas, uh, with the AI on demand platform, with Euro HPC, with standardization, and we have activities in all of these different areas so that we uh, can eventually coordinate. So the ELE program here complements these related initiatives and organizations and will obviously also make use of these different services and infrastructures because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We have done that way too often in the past. So um, this is all summarized in the supplementary document, which is perhaps already on the website, or if not, it will be very soon. So our objective in ELE2 was to extend and to revise the SRIA produced by ELE1. Um, our additional consultations have not brought to light any need for substantial groundbreaking revisions. Instead, we got really overwhelming support. Yeah, everybody liked the idea, endorses the idea. Um, that was good. And we um, found overall strong endorsement by all stakeholders. And we compiled this document now with the various pieces of additional evidence, um, amongst others from the SF. FSTP projects, um, so this will be published very soon. And with this, I think I would like to close. Thank you very much for your attention, for being here today. Uh, we are now breaking for coffee and we'll reconvene in this room in 30 minutes. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>